be looking today at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, as we continue our series here in the book of Ephesians. I, I need to confess, in as much as we have a communion tonight, I want to be as careful as I can with my time, and so I have a lot more notes than I'm probably going to give to you, um, just being aware of the fact that we have communion. So um, I will be sharing a few things with you, and you'll see that in just a moment that uh, are basically just uh, looking at uh, previous verses and one thing in particular. You'll see that in a moment. Let's begin reading in chapter 4 here of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11. We'll read to verse 16, get into our study. Paul writes, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speak the truth in love. May, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, Paul has been writing the Ephesians concerning what are called the grace gifts. And he's writing the Ephesians concerning God's grace, grace gifts to the church. And last time we were together, we noted two things. And let me lay that as a foundation. Two things. One, we noted that each believer, every person in Christ, every one of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift. And, and second, we uh, noted that Jesus obtained the right to give these gifts by his death and resurrection. Now, I mentioned that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are intended for the benefit of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 makes that clear. So you may desire a certain gift, but it's God who determines which gifts he gives to you. And the gifts, he says in his word, are distributed to each one individually as God wills. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. So let me share a little bit about the spiritual gifts. This is not a thorough exposition related to spiritual gifts, but let me share a little bit about it as I introduce tonight's study. In the New Testament, there are various books that that speak of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you take notes, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and 1 Peter chapter 4, all speak of the spiritual gifts and even give us a list of what are called spiritual gifts. So in 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, Paul gave us a, a list of the various gifts. He spoke of the word of wisdom. So when you have the word of wisdom, that, that's insight that comes directly from God it's the ability to answer something very quickly with his wisdom. So he gives you a word of wisdom. The word of knowledge is, is knowledge of facts that are beyond our normal way of finding things out. He speaks of supernatural faith. He speaks of healings. He speaks of the working of miracles. When he speaks of supernatural faith, that isn't saving faith. It's not living faith. It's not our walk of faith. It's not even the faith that we exercise when we serve God. When he speaks of supernatural faith, it's a faith for the moment. And it can also be part of what is referred to as a gift mix. So we can see faith and we can see healing. We can see working of miracle in script, miracles in Scripture. We can see that in Acts chapter 3, for example. When the, the Bible speaks to us about the apostles, Peter and John, and they're at the temple, and they're there, the scripture says, in the hour of prayer. And they encountered a man who had been born crippled, and he was begging at a gate that was called the beautiful gate. And in that particular portion of scripture, we see that Peter exercised faith, healing, and the working of miracles. We see a gift mix in operation. In Acts chapter 3, verses 4 and 10, this man had seen Peter and John as they were about to enter the gate, and, and they, he, looking up at them, because Peter said, look upon us, was expecting to receive something from them. And so 
when, he's, when he was looking at Peter and Peter was looking back at him in Acts chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, it says, fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. We see there in operation a gift mix. He had faith. There was a miracle. There was a healing all together. So Peter exercised what we refer to as the gift mix. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12, verse 6, it speaks of the gift of prophecy. Let me say that very briefly. Prophecy in the Old Testament primarily spoke of the revealing of future events. It's also called foretelling. But in the New Testament, it can speak of foretelling future events. It also speaks of what is called forthtelling or revealing God's intentions, speaking forth those things that God is going to do. Sometimes prophecy is revealed as proclaiming the gospel, because in the proclamation of the gospel, when prophecy is occurring, it actually exposes hearts. In 1 Corinthians, we see that in chapter 14, verses 24 and 25, when Paul said, if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. So when the word uh, is being used, when prophecy is occurring, people's hearts are opened up and God has an opportunity to save them. Now he speaks concerning in 1 Corinthians twelve ten a gift of discernment or the discerning of spirits. That's the ability to distinguish whether something is spiritually true or if it's false. All believers can have discernment because of God's word and by God's spirit, and it can develop over time. But this spiritual gift gives you an immediate awareness. When I was a brand new believer, I hadn't been saved more than two weeks, maybe three. I was at my parents' house, and uh, there was a knock on the door. I was the only one home. I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know. I don't know basically anything. I can't even pronounce the books of the Bible properly yet. I don't know anything. I'm a brand new Christian. There's a knock on the door, and, and I open the door, and as I open the door, I kind of freaked out the people who were standing there because I was a hippie, so my hair was kind of wild, and I was wearing a Japanese robe with dragons and stuff on it, so it kind of freaked them. <laughs> it freaked them out. I was barefooted. Yeah, I never realized until I just said that how freaky I must have looked to these Jehovah's Witnesses because there were Jehovah's Witnesses at the door. And I'm a brand new Christian. And so I opened the door. I said, hi, how can I help you? I mean, God had changed my life. I'm so filled with, I was filled with joy. And, hi, how can I help you? Well, we're Christian, how did they put it? We are Christian workers sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with our neighbors. And I said, wonderful. You know, I didn't know him from Adam. And I said, wonderful, I'm a Christian too. I just got saved. Now this wild-eyed hippie kid with weird hair and a Japanese robe is scaring them, but I'm telling them I'm a believer too because I'm thinking they may be. Well, they start talking to me and they begin to share with me. And I said, well, what are you here to share? Oh, we want to tell you about the kingdom. I said, oh, great, let's hear it. You know, because I'm hungry. Let's talk about God. I'm brand new. They started saying things to me. I can't tell you what it was that they were saying, but I can tell you this. I stopped them after about a minute or two. And I said, you know, I said, I don't think what you're saying is true. I said, but you know what? I, that's cool. Because I was a hippie. We didn't argue with anybody. So I said, ow. So I said, that's, <laughs> that's cool. That's all right. I said, you know, but uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think what you're saying is true. How would I know that? I'm a brand new Christian. I'm just beginning to read the Bible. The gift of discernment. So you have probably had that happen in your life too, where something is being said. My mom used to say, that sounds like tin. I don't know why she would say that, but it was another way for her to say, that doesn't sound true. 
That doesn't sound right. Have you had that experience? Many of us have. It's over spiritual things. It's when someone telling you about God or something about the future or whatever, and, and you're listening, and it's the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit giving you discernment, the discernment of spirits? It's the ability to distinguish whether something is true or false spiritually. Of course, again, all believers can have discernment by reading the Word of God because it's the Word of God that gives you wisdom and knowledge, but there are times when God's Holy Spirit will give you an instantaneous awareness, and that is something that would be of the Spirit. It's like in Acts chapter 8 where Simon the sorcerer tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 8, verse 23, as he was speaking to the, uh, the apostle Peter and tried to buy the gift of the Spirit, in chapter 8, verse 23, Peter said, I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And so there was this discernment, and he saw exactly what was going on and saw through it. There's the gift of tongues, which is unlearned languages, earthly or heavenly. Tongues give praise to God. There's the interpretation of tongues. Interpretation is not translation. Interpretation gives the sense or the meaning of what's being said. There's the gift of helps. The gift of helps is the spiritual desire to be of help to those who are in need. There's the gift of administration, which is the ability to organize and give information for more effective service. There's the gift of prophecy, which we saw in Romans chapter 12, 6 through 8. It speaks of prophecy. There's a there's the gift of ministry, which speaks of service or serving in ministry. There's the gift of teaching. Uh, the word teaching speaks of directing. It speaks of admonishing. It speaks of instructing. There's a gift, a spiritual gift of teaching. There's the gift of exhortation. Exhortation is encouragement. The word literally speaks of coming alongside of someone to comfort them. And so there's that gift of exhortation. There's the gift of giving, which very few people have. And it's <laughs> and that, that speaks of sharing with generosity. Uh, there's the gift of leadership, which speaks of presiding or standing before. And, and it's, you do that with a diligence. You do that with enthusiasm. You do it with earnestness. There's the gift of mercy, which is compassion. It's, it's a sense of pity. It's the ability to weep with those who are weeping. And you do so according to Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 8. You do it with cheerfulness. And then in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, uh, it teaches us to minister gifts to one another as good stewards of the grace of God. So the one who speaks, he refers to the one who speaks. Uh, when he says the one who speaks, that's with the knowledge that, that he's giving out the divine utterances of God. And the one who ministers as a deacon does so with the abilities that God supplies. So I would encourage you to go through and to look at this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, 1 Peter chapter 4, and begin to pray and ask the Lord what spiritual gifts he's given to you. Again, I mentioned that each believer has at least one spiritual gift, and I also mentioned that Jesus, by virtue of his death and resurrection, gave these gifts. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at a third thing concerning the gifts that God gives to the church. And that's something that might not be recognized for what it is. Because Paul points out that ministers are gifts that God has given to the church. That's why Paul says he himself gave some to be apostles. Now the thought that ministers are grace gifts to the church is foreign to many people, all too often pastors and leaders of the fellowship are looked at as being anything but a gift. Sometimes they may even be recognized as the problem within the church, and sometimes that's true. Some who occupy the office of pastor have forfeited the, the respect that is due the office, and that can be because they're unqualified. They shouldn't have been there in the first place. And that's why in 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, Paul had said that the overseer must be blameless because his way of life can make the gospel attractive or it can undermine the work of the gospel. So Paul is making it clear that church leadership is a gift to the body of Christ. It's to be valued, it's to be honored because of its eternal impact on believers. Now, as I read this and as I have prepared this in the past, it, it always causes me to, to at least pause for a moment and to, to out, out, out loud, we'll say today, tonight, to, to, uh, to give honor to 
to my own pastor, to my pastor, Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith was my spiritual father, and I loved him, and I respected him. But the one thing that I remember well about him is he didn't demand that. He just earned it. And so when a church has ministers who are doing the right thing by the Lord and for them, they're honored. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, it says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. In 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. In Hebrews 13, 17, he says, obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as one who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So Paul is speaking here in Ephesians 4, 11 following of grace gift, the grace gift that God gave to the church, the grace gift of the officers, offices of the church. And he begins in this way again, verse 11, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Notice this, he himself gave some. The calling and placing into service originates with God and not man. Spiritual leadership begins with the gifting of God, not the selection of man. And spiritual leadership is not something you call yourself to. Spiritual leadership is something God calls you to. And Paul begins to speak of this, and he gives various offices and these offices made up the foundation of church leadership. First, he begins by speaking of apostles, notice, and prophets. Now, I'll speak on this for just a moment, teach you a few things, because there are those who have asked if there are modern-day apostles. You'll see it sometimes. I mean, if you watch TV at all, if you ever turn on some of these religious channels and all, sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, uh, in the heading or whatever, Apostle Bob Jones or whatever, you know, Apostle. And so there are people who have asked in the past, are there modern day apostles? And I don't know how many of you think that there are, but there aren't. There are no modern, and let me tell you why, and I'll, I'll share this with you for a moment. Because apostles is a word that is normally restricted to the original apostles including Paul. And there were certain requirements that applied to the office of apostle. One, they were selected by Jesus. In John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. One, the apostles were selected by Jesus. They were part of the first followers of Jesus Christ and they were witnesses of his resurrection. In Acts chapter 1, 21 and 22, it says, It is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So one, they were chosen by Jesus, and two, they were part of the first followers of Jesus, witnesses of resurrection. Three, they performed miracles. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. So when Paul was speaking of his apostleship, he said the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you. In Romans 15, 18, and 19, he said, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which God has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Irilicum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, signs and wonders. And also, finally, they wrote scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 15, and 16, it says, regard the patience of our Lord to, uh, to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, 
in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So the apostles fulfilled all of these requirements, and there's nobody today writing scripture. There's nobody that fits this. They didn't walk with Jesus. They didn't see as a witness his resurrection. So no, there are no modern day apostles. And there's no biblical evidence that any of the original apostles were replaced when they died. So with that said, apostles and prophets served to lay foundations of the early church. They did it by receiving the word of God and declaring God's word to the world. We already saw this in Ephesians 2.20 where Paul speaks about being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. In chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 4 and 5, he said, You may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So you had the apostles, you have the prophets. Now the prophets were initially used to communicate the mind of God to the church. For example... When you read your scriptures, you, meant, you, you meet a man by the name of Agabus. He's mentioned twice in the books of, book of Acts in chapter 11, verse 28, as well as chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. Agabus prophesied concerning a famine that would come, as well as the imprisonment of the apostle Paul. But neither of these groups were what are called self-perpetuating. God appointed both, and no longer seems, they no longer seem to function in the identical fashion found in the first century church. Then you have evangelists. It's interesting to note that there's only one person in Scripture ever referred to as the evangelist, and that's a man by the name of Philip in Acts 21, verse 8. And so the evangelist is the one who goes forth proclaiming the word of God with the intention of giving the gospel message in such a way that people will hear it, be convicted by the Spirit, and be drawn to Christ. That's what the evangelist does. And there are people who hold that office today. Very often, missionaries would be actually holding the office of evangelists because they go out through the world and they preach the gospel with the intention of drawing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, not everybody is called an evangelist, but every one of us do the work of an evangelist. See, the church is intended to take the message of the gospel, to live it, and when given re opportunity, to, to, to uh, we, we, we uh, receive it and we give it. And so as we've been given the word of God, we take what we have been given and we give it out. And so all of us are called to do the work of an evangelist. All of us are being called to be witnesses to go forth and to take the word of God out. So you have apostles, you have prophets, you have evangelists, and then we're going to spend some time now looking at the pastor, teacher. You might find it interesting here, but when he speaks of pastors and teachers, that's really the same kind of office. And we're going to look at that for just a moment. You see, the word pastor is often translated shepherd. The shepherd is the one who feeds and cares for God's sheep. The teacher refers to how feeding takes place. It's through the teaching of the word of God. So God uh, gifted certain individuals to feed his people his word, and the intent is to bring people to full spiritual maturity. So the pastor teacher is given to the church for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Notice that. It says in verse 12, he says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I want to talk to you about this for a moment. Hopefully, I'll be able to do so briefly, which is really just not true. <laughs> but I'll try. I really will. The word equipping is an interesting word. When it says in verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, that's an interesting word. And let me share with you a little bit about that. To equip the church and to edify the body of Christ. Well, the word equip speaks of restoring something to its original condition. The word equip speaks of mending or making something complete. The word equip is a word that is used when referring to mending or repairing nets that the fishermen used. 
In Mark 1, verse 19, it says, When Jesus, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. The word mending is the same word as equipping. They had spent the night attempting to catch fish. Sometimes the, the nets would be stretched, perhaps broken, and they would repair it. So the work of the pastor teacher, this is very important. I could stay here, and I, I, I really am tempted to, because it's that important. The work of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The work of the pastor teacher is to bring healing and mending to broken lives. And the way that takes place is through God's word. And I've had people over the years ask me why I only teach the Bible and I teach the way I do, which I try to take my time and bring you because the only way broken lives will ever be healed is by the word of God. And that's what pastor teachers are intended to do. That's, that's what we do. And the pastor teacher restores people through the word of God and equips people to serve God. You see, the evangelist brings people to Jesus Christ, but pastors equip them for the work of service. So by giving out God's word, healing and restoration can occur and people can be used by God. You see, the pastor teacher is equipping them for the work of ministry. No one person can do all ministry any more than one person can make up a team. For a church to be healthy, the entire church is to be equipped and they are to serve the Lord together. And the pastor's main concern should be the word of God and prayer. So the pastor must teach the entire word of God, which equips the saints, and the fruit will be that the church is healthy and service-oriented. You see, verse 12 says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying refers to developing fruitful, maturing believers who serve the Lord. And so... If we can concentrate on giving out what God's word says, then those with a hungry heart to receive are going to be restored. Their broken hearts are going to be healed. Their broken lives will be repaired. And they're going to be used by God to bring the same word that healed them to other people. And so the pastor's ministry and the importance of a pastor is that he teaches the word of God so that people will be built up, edified by the things that the word of God says to them. And the result is going to be the unity of faith and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 13, till we all come to the unity of faith, the knowledge of the son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that's God's purpose for us, the unity of faith and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. When he speaks in verse 13 of being a perfect man, the word perfect speaks of, of perfectly mature. It doesn't speak of, of sinless perfection. It speaks of a maturity that grows over time. God's intention is for us to become mature, to be developed in Christ. And the knowledge of Jesus, when received and applied, is going to result in spiritual maturity. And God is forming us. He's forming us into his son's image, and he does it through an internal transformation that comes through the word of God. In chapter 3, verse 17, he said that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So as we live in Jesus, we're being transformed, and we begin to reveal the image of God to people because it's God's design that we would be conformed to Jesus' image. In Romans 8, 29, it says, Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So unity and, and, and true experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ and a progressive spiritual maturity in him reveal that God is in work in us, at work in us, as well as in his body, in the church. Now, when he speaks about unity, because we're to be united till we come, verse 13, I'll come to unity. Paul isn't speaking only of agreement, that we agree and we don't argue. He's not speaking of just a basic kind of unity. He's speaking of the unity of the faith. And the unity of the faith speaks of the bond that exists between all of us who are born again. Someone said the unity of the faith speaks of all believers sharing the same faith in God through Jesus as well as sharing the same level of conviction to the same revealed truth. He wants us to mature together, the body of Christ to grow together. 
to mature and to work together and serve the Lord together, to love one another, to become like Christ so that the world will see us and know that God is at work in the church. And that's what we're to do. We're, we're, to, we're to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the understanding of what the faith is. Now, when he speaks of the faith, he's not speaking of, again, faith to live or, or faith to be saved. He's speaking of the, of the entire doctrine of God. The faith is used to speak of doctrine or teaching that is understood as being God. It's un, uh, God's truth. It's recognized in that way. It speaks of revealed truth that has been passed on through proper teaching. It's like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, when he said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? In Colossians 2, 6, and 7, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught overflowing with thankfulness. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. It's not that you resist him by saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. It's what Jesus did when he said, it is written, when being tempted by Satan. It is written, it is written, it is written. And the only way we're going to know what is written is if we read the word ourselves, memorize it and understand it, and two, get taught it. And that's why the pastor's responsibility is teaching the word of God. The Lord hasn't called me to be a comedian. He hasn't called me to be an entertainer. He hasn't called me to develop light shows up here and, and fast at fantastic musical productions. He has called me to teach his word so that we together may grow to be mature in Christ and the church can reflect and reveal what God really is about because we live for him in a proper way through proper teaching. That's how it works. That's how it works. Some people say, well, I like a lot of entertainment. Well, who doesn't? I like being entertained too. Some people say, I like to be amused. Well, you know, just think about what that word means. The word amused is, is an interesting word. I'll say it quickly, but it's an interesting word. The word amuse is actually to be without thought or without thinking because the word muse means thoughtful or thinking. When you put the word, the letter A in front of it, it means without, without thought, without thinking. That's what amusement is. It's that we don't think we're simply entertained. And so some people go to church to be amused. They want to be entertained so they don't think. But the Bible doesn't teach that, we're, that I, as a pastor, am supposed to entertain you. The pastor is to teach you. And it takes long study hours, a lot of time, in order to rightly divide the word of truth. And that's what Paul said is a gift to the church, that they actually have shepherds who care about them to teach them the truth. And the teacher is a gift. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. These shepherds give God's word, feeding them with his wisdom and with his understanding. In Acts 20, 32, Paul said it like this. He said, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Why are we to be built up? Verse 14 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Teaching equips us to serve, and it also protects us from, from unhealthy teaching. The result of proper teaching, Paul is saying, is that we will no longer be tossed by error like children. If we're to have the unity of faith, it needs to be built upon the truth of the word. That unity is uh, that we have agreed on the various things that are of the Lord. And so false teachers will introduce error and will manipulate, and they give error disguised as truth. And then the false teachers undermine the gospel, and what they're doing is they're bringing people into bondage. 
So what is the antidote? Well, the antidote for this is reading and remaining in God's word. In 1 Peter, uh, it, it reads in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so when he speaks concerning the fact that we are not to be tossed to and fro and carried about, um, many years ago now, I, somebody contacted me and said that they were aware of a particular pastor in a particular city uh, distance from here. And they said, you know, I'm concerned for this fellow because he's, he's doing odd things. And I said, really, what is he doing? Well, he's, well he's, he rode his motorcycle up the middle of the church, um, just rode up from the back of the church up to the front, went up the steps with his motorcycle to draw attention to the point he was going to make in his sermon. I said, really? He said, yeah, on another occasion, he repelled from the ceiling and came down at his pulpit, and it just drew a lot of attention, but he's doing outlandish things. I said, like what? He said, well, he was teaching on being mature in the Lord, and so he went to, got behind the pulpit and stepped out, and he was wearing a baby diaper, and he said, you're not to be children, and he was wearing a diaper. I said, really? <laughs> so this is true. These are things that he actually did because I contacted him. And I said to him, I said, listen, I said, I went to your web page and I opened up some of your messages. And I said to him, you're not a bad teacher. You gave a good study. You applied the scripture properly, rightly divided it. Why? are you doing these outlandish things? Can you tell me why? I said, and let me tell you something. That isn't something a man of God is to do. And I went on to tell him why. So as a pastor to another pastor, I contacted him. He wrote me back. And he said, you're the first pastor who has actually approached me and addressed this with me. And I want to tell you, I'm sorry. I was wrong in doing these things. I need to repent from these things. You see, people will come for the weirdest stuff. You know, motorcycles, repelling, diapers. I mean, come on. But that's what happens today. And I, I have to be careful because, not because I, I'm afraid to say something. I just, we're going to have communion and I have to finish this passage. But I have seen outlandish things. One of the things I have discovered about Jesus is that Jesus was unbelievably normal. Unbelievably normal. He didn't do weird things. He didn't float in the air and spin around and yell and do weird stuff. He was, he was perfect humanity. Didn't need to draw attention through theatrics. He just gave his word. And when the word goes forth and people are hungry, their lives are changed. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, the church needs to be built up in the most holy faith. Be careful for the false teachers, but instead, and I'll close verses 15 and 16, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So instead of being tossed about by winds, hurricane gales of doctrine, mature believers are to speak the truth in love. They speak and they preach the truth, resisting the deceit of error. And by receiving God's word through the gifts, we are to spiritually mature. And as we grow, we grow to love the truth. And as we love the truth, we speak the truth with boldness. He says in verse 16 that ultimately we all do our share and we all pull our own weight. He says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Every part does its share. And I'll close with these words. We'll pick up next week. And as is my way I normally will go back and touch a few things and develop in. Um, let me close by saying this. When our church first began, um, 
as, as foundational scriptures, and there are certain scriptures our church has as foundational scriptures. One of them was this. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipment of the saints for the work of ministry going on down for every member, every part of the body to do its share. I was in India. I spent, uh, on two occasions, I, I spent uh, 16 days once and 12 days another time. Did ministry in India. Did it from, um, you know, the from the north to the south, had opportunity to go various places and do various things. And I was in the south, and I was on a seashore. And uh, as I was in the, in, in, on the seashore in a place, I believe it was called Kerala, it was in the south, and it was a, a, a seashore. And I was standing there, it was six in the morning, and I looked out, and I saw a line of Indian men. They were, there's uh, several of them on the shore, and they were all stepping, and where I was, I couldn't really see clearly. It was early, but I saw they were all stepping back in unison, and they were in the water, and they were stepping back in unison, and I had no idea what they were doing because I couldn't really see clearly, and so one of the men who was with me was an Indian who lived in that area, and I said, what are they doing? And he said, oh, those are fishermen. I said, really? Because I couldn't see. He said, they're drawing the net. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He said, they dropped a long net. It was a, lo it was a long net. He said, they dropped their net. He said, and each one of them is taking the steps. He said, they step in unison, each one, and they were doing that. You'd see them at the same time stepping back because as they work in unity, they're able to draw in the harvest of fish. And I looked at that. I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, they're all standing in line. Each one is holding one of the edges of the net. And they're pulling back, and as they're pulling back, they're catching fish, which they did. They eventually drew it up to shore, and the nets were full of fish. And I've never forgotten that. It's been a number of years now, because that's ministry. Every member doing its share. Every member ministering by the grace gifts God gave to them, pulling their own weight. Every member doing what that member was designed to do which is the work of ministry, all of us. And so the Lord taught me that, and I shared it with the church when our church was brand new. I said, I can't do everything. I don't have the ability to do everything that needs to be done. There are churches that have pastors. I've seen where the pastors in the worship team, pastor uh, does the, the word, the pastor at the end of the service goes up and prays for everybody. The pastor does all the ministry. I said, I can't do that. I want to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that we together can do our, you know, pull our weight, do our share, so that we together can see God move and we can all rejoice together at what he has done through us and accomplished through us. That wasn't something I invented. That's what Paul said the church is intended to do. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and slight cunning of men, so that we would grow up into full maturity in Jesus Christ, so that the world will see that we actually are his servants. And working together in unity, we may pull that net, draw people in, so that enter, they enter into the kingdom of God, so that not one person is doing everything, but we do all things together, and together we rejoice and together we glorify God because together we have been equipped. There's no superstar in the church other than Jesus himself. We're all laborers who do the work of ministry. And that's how I brought the church up from the very beginning. And that's why this passage is very important to me. Our Father, we bless you.